Hello everyone and welcome to American Civil War and UK History on YouTube and remember also on Facebook, Instagram and most of my videos are available as podcasts. Please find all relevant links in the description below. So joining me once again, I'm pleased to say, is author, writing professor, co-founder, editor and chief of Emerging Civil War, Chris Mikowski. Hello mate, thank you for joining me. Delighted to be back with you, thanks for having me. So we are here to discuss Grant's Last Battle, the story behind personal memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, a book written by Chris, which is part of the Emerging Civil War series. So Chris, what was it about Grant that you liked so much and what inspired you to want to write about him and the journey he goes on to put his memoirs onto paper? Uh, you know, I think that it's such a compelling human story because, you know, Grant, one of the great men of the ages, uh, he's kind of a marvel man of United States history. He was the most famous American of his time in the entire world. Uh, and so, you know, he's got, you know, just bigger, larger than life heroic proportions. Um, but when I found out, you know, that he's he's dying of cancer as he's trying to write his memoirs, he's you know, been financially ruined because of a business partner or two business partners that had swindled him. Um, and he's trying to just write this book so that he has some way to leave some money to his family before he dies. I mean, that to me seemed like such a human story uh, because who among us would not be motivated by that same sort of desire to care for our loved ones? Um, and so it was really a chance for me to get to know Grant in a very personal uh, very intimate level, it, it really his most vulnerable. Here's the guy who saves the country. Um, and then I get to spend time with him on this project um, as he's dying in, in some of his most intimate moments. Cool. So there are a few circumstances, obviously, that lead up to Grant writing his memoirs. And one being, uh, he did mention sort of a, a bit of it, but um, one, one main reason being a man of the name of Ferdinand Ward. So please tell us about this unsavory character. Uh, and unsavory is right. The guy was a complete sociopath. Um, he was known as the young Napoleon of Wall Street, kind of a play on um, George McClellan's nickname of the young Napoleon. Uh, he's 30 years old and his investment firm is returning um, uh, returns on investments of like 30%, which is astronomical, fantastic. People felt like they were losing money by not investing with his firm. Uh, but in fact, he was actually running a big Ponzi scheme. And so he was taking money from one investor and using that to pay off the investments made by another. And that second person would be like, oh, wow, look at these payoffs. Here's more money. And, and so he was just kind of uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. And it was a very precarious a situation. Nobody knew any of this, of course, until, uh, you know, what today we would call forensic accounting uh, went through all the books after the fact and, and figured all this out. And Ward fessed up to it as well. But Grant got involved because his son, Buck, was friends with Ward. And um, Ward suggested, hey, why don't we go into business together? I'll take care of everything. And we'll just use the prestige of your name on the firm. And so they called it Grant and Ward and four principal partners, James Fish, the uh, president of Marine Bank, which is the bank they laundered all the money through. Uh, or that way I say they, that uh, Ward laundered all the money through. Um, so it was James Fish, Ferdinand Ward, Buck Grant, and, uh, and uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And really when, when Grant Sr. would go to the office, he'd basically go to a second floor uh, office, smoke cigars, Ward would lay out 20 cigars on his desk every morning. Uh, Grant would smoke his way through them and work on pet projects. And you know, someone would come in with something for him to sign once in a while and he'd look it over and put his name on it and off it would go. And that was all the involvement Grant had in the, in the company. So it was really easy for Ward behind the scenes to be pulling all these shenanigans because Grant really wasn't paying attention. Okay, so what actually becomes a Ward after all of this? Um, what happens to him? So um, once the firm collapses, uh, Ward, as I said, he'll fess up. He and Fish will both go to jail. They'll serve, um, each, they'll each serve several years uh, in prison. Um, and then, um, but like, you know, Ward bribes his way out of prison so that he can go watch Grant's funeral procession after Grant dies in July of 85. And then he'll go back into prison. Um, he will spend the whole rest of his life 
continuing to try to run one scam or another, one swindle. Uh, he'll get married. He'll have a daughter. He'll kidnap his daughter after his wife realizes what a psycho he is. Um, it's just a crazy, um, colorful in all the worst sorts of ways, but a, a very colorful, crazy story. One great thing for historians that comes out of all of that is his descendant, Jeffrey Ward, is a writing partner for Ken Burns. And so uh, Jeff Ward has actually written some, some great stuff for Ken Burns. He's written a book about his ancestor, Ferdinand Ward, which I highly recommend. It's a fascinating story. Oh, cool. I didn't know that about the prison thing. That's really interesting. So he even swindles his way out of prison. <laughs> I mean, can imagine, yeah, I'll give you a few bucks, you know, get me out of prison. So um, how did the press at the time actually handle this whole situation? You know, because Grant's famous, isn't he, at this stage? You know, he's been president twice. He's been the general, you know. Uh, and, and all of that time in public service earned him a lot of enemies. Uh, and of course, the Republican Party, uh, you know, it's the, the beginning of the Gilded Age. The Republican Party certainly had its own forms of corruption at the time. Um, so there were many people who were sympathetic to Grant, but there were a lot of people who were looking for an opportunity to knock him down a few pegs. And so uh, the press really, um, uh, not all of the press, but but uh, uh, portions of the press really made a lot of hay out of this. And they thought like, oh, look, Grant is a crook. Um, and then once you know, Ward fessed up and the accounting becomes apparent and what's going on. It's like, well, okay, maybe he wasn't a crook, but maybe he was just incompetent or maybe he was criminally negligible, you know? And so each twist and turn was just like an extra knife in Grant's back. He was a man who um, really, really leaned on his own personal integrity that was deeply, deeply important to him. Um, ironic for a man who today is is perhaps best known, um, you know, for all the, the corruption and scandals in his administration. He himself had uh, incredible personal integrity and kind of surrounded himself at times with, with folks who maybe didn't live up to that same standard. So these attacks by the press on his integrity uh, were deeply, deeply uh, troubling to him. Uh, they wounded him terribly. Um, but for the most part, the American public didn't buy into those attacks. And, you know, when he would go out, uh, veterans of the army would particularly rally around him and really buoy his spirits and, and lift him up. And he found out that, uh, you know, um, people didn't hate him. Uh, in fact, he was still well-respected and well-loved. And, and that did a lot to um, really help with his moral support and getting him through a very, very difficult uh, couple of weeks. Okay, so how much did they actually did he actually swindle out of the grants in the end? By today's standards, uh, something like sixteen point eight million dollars um, in 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 um, in eighteen eighty four dollars. Um, and so by today's standards, you know that's into the um, you know hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so it was pretty devastating. It was enough that it, it triggered a crash on Wall Street. Um, a number of banks closed. They had to stop, uh, uh, you know, selling. So there was a financial crisis that resulted. Um, so it really shook the the financial foundations of New York. Oh right, okay. And also, obviously, this obviously, like you said, affected his well being as well. Obviously, because you know he's trusted this guy, and you know he's been severely let down big time. I mean, that's a lot of money. So yeah. So also, they had to sell. I understand many of their properties, including. Julia's family home, um, Whitehaven, is that correct? Correct, uh, an ironic name for a house that's the color of a, a lime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she said she cried when she signed the papers to sell off the house. Uh, fortunately, the house was preserved. It's a great National Park Service site out in St. Louis today. You can go and visit and get a sense of what um, life was like for the grants, um, you know, on a, on a domestic and personal uh, level before the Civil War. Is that somewhere you've actually managed to visit yourself, Chris? I have. Uh, I've been there twice, um, although it's been a long time since I've been there. And uh, a friend of mine, Nick Sacco, is a ranger out there. They do some great work, and it's really a great chance to, again, see a, a marble man in a very human way. Okay, so also I understand that at this point, Grant didn't have a pension. And so why was that? Obviously, he's been in the Army. He's uh, obviously served as a the, the highest ranking general, 
you know, at that point in the army. And then, of course, he's um, been president twice. So why didn't he have a pension? Great question. He did have a military pension, but he had to resign from the military in order to take control of the government as the leading civilian elected representative. And so he forfeited his right to his military pension when he did that. At the time, the United States government did not provide for a presidential pension. And so the, the idea was that, you know, you leave office and you go find something to do and, uh, you know, and, and you support yourself. So he, he had no pension at the time. And uh, so when this financial collapse comes, he's literally ruined and, and is left with, you know, a couple hundred dollars in a cookie jar and, you know, uh, 120 bucks in his pocket. And that's about it. Uh, and no way to provide for his family beyond selling all these properties that you mentioned. Okay. So at, at some point, the grants actually do settle and they sell for a time in Long Branch, New Jersey. So how was his time spent whilst he was there? And the peach comes into the story at this point. Uh, obviously, it's a very powerful part of the story and very sad. And can I just say very well written. Um, what was it like writing about that moment as he learns that he had cancer? And obviously, Grant being the fire he is, going to, you know, um, he goes on, doesn't he, to show the same sort of strength he did as a general. So please t explain a little bit more about that part of the story. Sure, sure. Uh, and the peach, I think the only peach more powerful in, in all of uh, literary history is the one that James rides in the Ronald uh, Dahl story, James and the Giant Peach. Um, but uh, the Grants family settles out at Long Branch because it's the one property they can't get a good price for as they're selling off their properties. And so Grant and uh, his, his uh, son Fred move out there because um, Fred you know, everybody in Grant's family loses their shirt in this collapse. Um, so Julia said, if there's one silver lining, it's that she's surrounded by her grandkids as, as they're out at Long Branch. And uh, Grant decides that, um, you know, he's got to find some way to make a living. And Century Magazine approaches him about writing some articles for them for the series that eventually becomes known as Battles and Leaders, which is a pretty standard reference tool for those of us who uh, do any sort of Civil War research. And some of it's still very, very readable today. Um, and Grant had turned them down before, um, figuring that he didn't need to revisit the past. Now suddenly he's got a financial necessity that triggers him to reconsider his, his decision. So he makes arrangements with the editors of the century to write a series of articles. He's going to write about Shiloh, uh, Vicksburg, the wilderness, and Appomattox although he changes his mind and swaps out Appomattox for Chattanooga, which I've always thought is a fascinating decision. Um, and he sets to work and they're gonna pay him $500 a piece and Grant feels pretty good because through his own power, he can earn money. Uh, and he resolves to pay back um, all of his personal obligations from this collapse. Obviously he can't pay back the, you know, the, the $60 million, but anybody that he owes money to, um, he's gonna to try to pay them back and he's gonna do it by trying to write. It's And that's how kind of things would have unfolded. And eventually he would have decided, hey, I like this writing. I'm going to write my memoirs. And he would have written a fantastic book. But along the way comes this peach that you mentioned earlier. Uh, it's early June, 1884. He takes a bite out of a peach after being out on the porch working in the morning and it stings him really bad. Oh, geez, he's trying to figure out, you know, maybe some insect or something. And he tries to wash out his throat with some water and he says it burns like drinking molten lead. Um, just terrible. And his wife's like, oh, well, we need to take you to the doctor. And in true soldierly fashion, Grant's like, ah, rub some dirt on it and walk it off. You know, he just wraps a scarf around his throat for a little counter pressure and goes back to work. And, uh, but by that night, he, pain hasn't gone away. He can't eat. He promises Julia he'll go see a doctor. He puts it off. And, you know, uh, as the story unfolds, it's not until October remember this is June. It's not until October that he gets an actual diagnosis from a doctor. His own personal physician has been in Europe and Grant won't go see another doctor until he had the chance to go see uh, his own doctor, Fordyce Barker. Barker doesn't like what he sees. And so then he sends Grant to a throat specialist who doesn't like what he sees and sends some samples off to a cancer specialist who doesn't like what he sees. And so the string of doctors really kind of, um, bring Grant to the realization that something is serious. And he asks one of them flat out, is it cancer? 
and the doctor doesn't sugarcoat it. You know, he says it's epithelial in nature, sometimes known to be curable. And we'll see what we can do. Uh, but one of the other doctors in private consultation, when he finds out it's Grant, he says, the, 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 the cancer is so bad, he says, General Grant is doomed. Um, back of his throat has a number of lesions, a lot of open sores, um, uh, and it's just a pretty aggressive form of throat cancer. I can't imagine what that would be like. That must be horrendous for him. Um, okay, so also I understand that he does obviously receive money from Union Veterans. So please explain in a little bit more detail about that. Sure. When when veterans find out that he's been financially ruined, as I mentioned earlier, they, they rally to his support. Uh, he actually gets a check from um, uh, some of the for five hundred dollars. Um, uh, a guy named Alfred Wood, who who was a industrial. Um, supporter of the war. He was too old to serve. And so uh, his his factory made products that supported the war. He's a textile mill, I believe. And uh, he said, here's $500 uh, payable for services rendered on April 9th, 1865. It's a reference to Lee's surrender at Appomattox. Um, and uh, please accept this as a loan repayable at your convenience. And Grant writes back and says, thank you very much. You have no idea how uh, helpful this is. I'll be absolutely sure I'm going to pay this back. Wood sends them another thousand dollars as a loan. Um, and Grant will use money from his articles for the Century magazine to pay back Wood. Wood doesn't want to take money from Grant, so he'll actually donate that money to charity. Um, you know, it really is a great act of generosity on Wood's part. Um, in Grant's last days, you know, just a couple of weeks before he dies, Wood will actually visit uh, Grant in person, and uh, Grant will have the chance to express his thanks to him uh, directly but uh, and so it goes uh, you know grant goes to the grand army of the republic and is elected by loud acclaim to be the president of the uh, gar um, he has the chance to serve as a co-marshal of the memorial day parade in brooklyn and you know tens of thousands of veterans come out hundreds of thousands of people come out to greet him um, he has the chance to go and speak to a reunion of the united states christian commission uh, and they rally to him. Um, he's so moved by their out, uh, their outpouring of support that he chokes up in the middle of his speech and can't finish. Um, you know, moved by the uh, the mercies of the angels of the battlefield, as he called them. Um, so it's these huge outpourings of support, both uh, moral support and financial support, um, that really help Grant. As I said, he won't take charity. He's a proud man. He will. He turns away several attempts for people to just give him money. Um, at one point, um, to help prop up Grant Ward, he had borrowed $150,000 from um, uh, Vanderbilt, the richest man in the world. And um, when when Vanderbilt found out that the, the firm had collapsed, he tried to just forgive the loan and said, ah, don't worry about it. Grant wouldn't let him forgive the loan. In fact, Grant took Vanderbilt to court to force Vanderbilt to enforce the loan, which Grant then paid off by donating all of the trophies and gifts and paraphernalia that had been given to him in a round the world trip a couple of years earlier. Uh, and it was all assessed at $150,000, how convenient. And Vanderbilt took possession of that and they were able to clear off the loan. Grant felt his conscience was served. Vanderbilt, uh, no good deed goes unpunished. The press harangued him for harassing Grant, even though Vanderbilt was trying to forgive the law. I mean, it's just terrible. So Vanderbilt actually turns all that stuff over to uh, um, the Library of Congress where uh, it's still on, uh, on display. And Grant is very relieved by that. He says that's how, it would, how he would have turned over uh, those artifacts if it was up to his power. So it's satisfactory end to all of that. I do find that funny, the fact that he has to go to court to get him to, to pay his own bill, but yeah, I think it's hilarious, actually. Right, so um, anyway, the, so like we mentioned, like you mentioned earlier, the articles for Century Magazine, um, obviously, so this is where he first gets approached to start writing stuff, is that correct? Yeah, and uh, 
and he finds that he really likes the work. I mean, he never thought of himself as a writer. He was very unsure of himself. Uh, and in fact, he gets one of his former staff members, Adam Badow, to come and look over his stuff and work with him as a writing assistant. Badow, who had been on his staff during the war, had been a theater critic for the New York Times, uh, or I'm not sure it was the Times, for one of the New York papers, um, uh, prior to the war, uh, he'd been friends with John Wilkes Booth, coincidentally, um, as a theater critic, they went in the same circles. Um, so, and then Badow, after the war, had made his career as a writer, as a novelist, and as the author of the three-volume Military History of Ulysses S. Grant. So Grant really leaned on Badow to help him through this article writing process. But along the way, Grant really discovered that he liked the writing. And in fact, he wanted to go beyond four articles and write a book. You know, he had a book in him. Um, and so then he's going to try to figure out, well, what's the best, uh, what's the best avenue for, for publishing these memoirs and, and where should I go with it? Okay, so again, like like you mentioned, so anyway, uh, no, sorry. Um, so he starts writing his bo uh, book in New York, uh, uh, Free East 66th Street. Um, Grant gets help with this book, as you said, by Adam Badell and one of his sons, Fred. So what were their roles in helping Grant put his memoirs together? Basically, um, they act as Grant's staff of fact checkers. And uh, so Grant would would write some stuff out and then Fred would uh, make sure that the dates were correct. They would consult maps. Bad Al would read over the prose and make suggestions, editorial suggestions. Um, and so the two of them, uh, they, and they didn't like each other very much at all. Uh, Bad Al had a tendency to be prickly. He was kind of a know-it-all, uh, but people put up with him because Grant put up with him. And so um, it was an uneasy working relationship between Bad Al and, and Fred Grant, but everything seemed to work out fine. Bad Al, in fact, moved into the house with the Grants uh, so that he could be there to help out and, and work readily with them. So another person I want to mention is Noble Dawson, who's going to come in later on in the process and serve uh, basically as Grant's scribe. Um, as Grant's throat begins to, to deteriorate, his voice um, begins to crumble, um, he'll start to dictate some of his stuff just because the medicine's making him woozy, um, but he's got to, you know, speak in a whisper a lot of times, and Dawson will act as a stenographer and, and write out a lot of what Grant says, and then Fred and Bad Eye will kind of take that and, and uh, you know, double check it all. Uh, but I, I want to point out, and, and this can't be said enough because it's a misconception, Grant is the primary author. He does all of the writing. Um, anybody who does anything in the manuscript does so sort of with nips and tucks as editors. Um, but we've got the manuscript, or I shouldn't say we, but the manuscript exists in Grant's hands, uh, in, in his handwriting. I mean, we can see that Grant wrote this book. And again, he gets um, sort of like a little bit of encouragement from a friend of his, which is Mark Twain, a uh, very big part and influence on Grant. So how do they actually know each other before he sort of starts deciding that I'm going to write my memoirs? And then, of course, he actually directs him in the direction of writing a memoir, doesn't he? Sure. Uh, the two of them actually met um, years earlier when Grant was president and Twain was serving as the secretary of the United States senator or one of the United States senators from Nevada. And the senator's like, hey, you want to meet the president? Come on. So, so Twain goes in and by this point, he has only published his famous story about the jumping frog, um, which has made him sort of like this hot literary phenomenon. Um, but Grant, you know, the most famous man of his age and, and Twain goes in there and, and there he's sitting behind his desk. Uh, with an expression on his face as Grant, as Twain described it, um, like a man who has not smiled for seven years and was not scheduled to smile for another seven. So they try a little small talk, but it's pretty awkward. And finally, Twain just admits, I don't know about you, Mr. President, but I'm feeling kind of awkward. And uh, Twain reported that the president cracked the hint of a smile seven years ahead of schedule uh, and Twain made his uh, exit from that uh, from that meeting. So fast forward to, um, you know, Grant 
finishes his presidency. He goes on this two year round the world trip. When he comes back, he's coming across the country and he's being greeted all along the way with parades and, and uh, you know, big meetings and public gatherings. Well, I guess in Chicago, they're gonna do a reunion of the army of the Tennessee. So all of his veterans from the West come to the city for three days of celebrations. And they asked Twain to be the keynote speaker at the banquet that will kind of sum up or, or cap off the event. And Twain comes out on the first day and he's watching the army, uh, the veterans parade on by and they're in formation. And all of a sudden they give out this loud, uproarious cheer. And Twain knows it's not for him. And he looks down the balcony and he realized Grant has come out onto the balcony. And, and, and Grant sees Twain there and cracks a little bit of a smile and he says, I don't know about you, Mr. Twain, but I'm not feeling awkward at all today. Um, and you know, making a reference back to that first meeting. So they spent a lot of time just hanging out over the course of the weekend. They're both uh, famous cigar smokers. And finally, the banquet comes, and it's on Sunday. And it's you know, Twain is is the like the twelfth out of twelve speakers bat and clean up. It's a position he says no one has ever asked for. It's a smoke filled alcohol drenched night and everyone's getting up giving their speeches and i want to propose a toast to grant i want to propose a toast to julie i propose a toast to the officer to the army to this this so finally twain gets up after all this and he says well in the course of our remembrances tonight we have remembered everybody but one important group the babies and people are like what the heck is he talking about he talks about how like somewhere out in the world today is the next great figure of the age. Just as Grant, once upon a time, was a baby and became the next great man of the age. And so imagine out there, some baby just like Grant, who is exerting the incredible powers of his concentration solely and trying to get his big toe into his mouth. And the whole audience is like... And Grant just busts out laughing, thinks it's the funniest thing. And so that lets the air out of the room. And, and Grant says, or I mean, Twain later says that his, his speech, he just had him right there in the palm of his hand. It was a great success, he said. So this really cements the relationship between the two men. When Grant settles into headquarters on Wall Street, where he has his office, Twain, who has his publishing company up in Hartford, comes into the city often, and he'll go up to Twain's or to Grant's office and to him with smoke cigars and shoot the breeze a bit. Well, one of these trips, he brings with him his friend William Dean Howells, who's a, a literary critic and editor, and um, they have this conversation. And um, over the course of the conversation, they said they have lunch together. And it's like beans and, and coffee, camp fare, as Twain describes it. And Twain suggests, hey, why don't you? print your memoirs, you know, I, I could help you get your memoirs published. And Grant says, no, 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 it's all, it's all in Badow. That's his common response. Adam Badow has written his three volume military history. And uh, so Grant says he doesn't need to write his own. It's all in Badow. Twain says, all right. So when uh, flash forward to 1884 and, and uh, you know, Grant's deciding he wants to write a book, and he's thinking, oh, maybe Century Magazine can do this book deal for me. And they draw up a contract. And, and Grant's literally reading the contract when Twain comes in with a counteroffer. And they dicker. And it's going to go on for a couple months. Um, but Grant will eventually give the contract to Twain rather than the Century Magazine. And it really comes down to one of the main motivators in Grant's life, and that's personal loyalty. And he feels a great deal of loyalty to Century Magazine because they gave him the opportunity to write these memoirs, or to, to write these articles. Um, but in the course of the negotiation, you know, Grant actually just says, like, Century Magazine came to me first. And Twain says, oh, well, if it's a matter of coming to you first, remember that lunch we had with Dean Howells? And Grant remembers it. And he remembers that Twain asked to publish the memoirs before Grant even wanted to write memoirs. And so that gets Grant listening. And you know these negotiations then turn into Twain's favor. And to Twain's great credit, he goes to incredible lengths to protect Grant and his family with this project. He sees this as a license to print money. He says that every veteran in America will be morally obligated to buy a copy. It's gonna, this can't fail. Um, 
but he's not in it really to to get rich for himself he's in it to provide for his friend he will give grant 85 percent of the uh of the royalties which is unheard of um he will assign the copyrights to julia rather than grant so that if any creditors want to try to steal those proceeds uh, in payment of debts from grant and ward julia will own that copyright so you know, um, after Grant dies, she'll be secure. Um, so Grant really, um, really um, comes out with a sweetheart deal because his friends looking out for him, and it will it will serve the family well. Thank you. That was a long answer to your question. Well, I tell you what, I, I, I was watching. I thought I was watching Emerging Civil War there, and I nearly got lost. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So going back to what you were saying earlier about Grant, pretty much, well, no, he did. He wrote it all. So the news, a new story comes out, isn't it, um, that um, Grant hadn't written anything. And obviously Adam Badal wanted to take all the credit for it, you know, as people do, um, most of the book. So he wrote a letter with a load of uh, demands and grievances. Um, why, why was he so, you know, upset about all of them? Why did he try to, you know, jump in the spotlight, if you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and, you know, here's a moment where, and I don't have a lot of sympathy for Bad Out, but, you know, in this moment, I understand, like, he has written the three-volume definitive history of Ulysses S. Grant's military history. And then Grant decides he wants to write his own memoirs, which is going to undercut everything Bad Out wrote. And then Grant says, can you help me out? And so, like, there's this moment where Bad Out realizes, like, he's going to be an instrument of his own irrelevance and he says yes so the story somehow leaks in april of 1885 that the grant's not the author of his memoirs that bad i was actually the author and we don't know how that story gets out but everyone expects bad out to say no grant's writing this himself but instead he presents grant with this letter that's essentially a blackmail letter saying like eh, if you uh, pay me another ten thousand dollars i'll tell everybody you were the sole author and Grant, um, who was very unsure of himself as a writer when this relationship kind of started, uh, let's bad out have it with both barrels. I mean, and this is a, this is a, a Brutus moment, you know, um, a Judas Iscariot moment, um, because Grant had done so much to sustain bad out over his his professional career, and for bad out to stab Grant in the back like this, and so Grant lets him have it, and he writes this letter that's incredible, and it's 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 like you're an awful human being, and nobody likes you. You're loathsome. You're prickly. You've got a terrible temper, and nobody puts up with you except because I like you, your mom doesn't even like you. You know, it's like it gets down to that. And then at the very end, it's like, but if there's anything I can ever do to be of service to you, please don't hesitate to stop by. Uh, <laughs> and he kicks Bad Al out. Uh, and, and the key here is that, you know, as I said, he, he'd been very insecure about his writing, but as he wrote, he discovered the pride of authorship. And he discovered he liked what he was doing, that he had something to say, um, that it was worth saying. Um, and, and, you know, he had great motivations. He wanted to secure his family's financial fortune or, you know, um, he, he wanted to make sure he had, you know, he framed the meaning of the war. So, you know, like big picture ideas. So all of this stuff. And he realized like all this time he'd been a writer. If you look at all of his orders that he had written, uh, they were known for their clarity. He wrote all the correspondence that a president would typically write. He handled himself. Um, and so, yeah. And then, of course, he had guys like, like Twain saying, this stuff is brilliant. It hardly needs to be edited at all. It's a masterpiece. Um, and so, you know, Grant comes into his own as a writer. Uh, so by the time Badow tries this blackmail tactic, it's like, you're barking up the wrong tree now, you know, and uh, Bado is out of the picture. Um, ironically, Bado will later write a book called Grant in Peace that's about Grant's, um, you know, presidency, his round the world trip, it's his last days, uh, his, his death and his memoirs, and he'll write it as though he's still part of Grant's inner circle, and whether he does that to sort of try to ingratiate himself to Julia and apologize for his poor behavior, or whether he was just trying to make a quick buck or both, uh, but most people kind of saw through the charade. Um, 
but uh, you know, and it's just swollen purple prose, you know, the great hero's suffering as he wrote pen to paper, recounting, and that's just, oh, it's just dreadful stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a very, very Victorian melodrama. So, so you're not very keen on his, uh, his books then? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, so, I mean, if you're looking for a good colorful phrase, I mean, I quote him a lot in my book because yeah. as he, he is a colorful writer, but boy, it's over the top. Okay. I, um, right now, this is important because I've got to ask about this because um, I know this uh, probably gets you excited every day you see them. So before we move on to the next part of the story, I understand you have some doors from a townhouse, and was it in a town a townhouse from Washington D.C. where? So when Grant, yeah, when Grant served as uh, general in chief of the army, he had a townhouse that was purchased for him by admirers from New York, and that's where he and Julia lived. Um, immediately following the civil war and before he was elected president and it's, it was a townhouse on northwest i street uh, it was eventually obliterated by the construction of interstate 395 that goes up through washington dc not too far from capitol hill um and julia loved the house and in fact once they you know, moved to the white house she didn't want to sell the house but grant's like we don't need it um so they sold it at a profit to their friend william t sherman who, as Grant's successor, as General in Chief of the Army, ended up living in the same house. So the doors that you've put up there in the PowerPoint, um, when the townhouse was demolished to make room for the interstate, they ended up in the basement of the Episcopal Church in Arlington, which had been the very same church that Robert E. Lee had belonged to once upon a time. A parishioner had salvaged the doors from the construction project, taking them over to the church and they were going to use them as part of a renovation that they were doing for one of the church buildings. But apparently they were a little upset that Grant's doors would be in Robert E. Lee's church, so they never put them up. So when my father-in-law bought Stevenson Ridge, or the property that has now become Stevenson Ridge back in 2001, he built uh, in 2011 the main event center, which is called The Lodge. And that's that white building that you see there uh, on the left part of the screen. And as he's building the building, someone told him about these doors in a church basement. So he recut the door frame, bought these doors, brought them in, mounted them. And uh, so when you walk in the front doors of Stevenson Ridge, you then walk into a lobby and, and you come up to these doors, which were Grant's townhouse doors. Uh, the glass at the top is uh, still original. Um, a lot of the fixtures and hardware on the door is original. Um, they're just uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, pieces, of, uh, pieces of art, I think. Yeah, definitely. And so when you first walked into that event center, you must have gone, what, these were definitely, uh, these were owned by Grant, you know, I mean, you must have been really excited about it. I know it sounds a bit silly, but. <laughs> I, I have to, I have to remind my wife that I love her for more than Grant. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I only married you for your doors, love. Sorry. <laughs> no, honestly, I mean, you probably get caught talking to them sometimes, do you? Or, you know, having a quick cheeky little look at them? Or... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it is, yeah, not, not to make too much of it, but when I go in there, like I do take a moment and, you know, I'll touch the doors or just take a second and remind myself that I'm privileged enough to be this close to history every day yeah uh, and grant is someone i respect tremendously and to have some little piece of his life that that i've got a tangible connection to is a real privilege it is really cool really cool and if i do make it to the symposium this year i'm going to touch them too but anyway there you go <laughs> you can have your own cheeky moment with them <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> i might ask everyone to leave the room no i'm only joking anyway i'm alone with the door <laughs> <laughs> oh dear right grant's mountain cottage mount mcgregor new york um obviously he goes there to finish his book but also the clock's ticking on his cancer as well um what makes him decide to go to mount mcgregor and of course like i just said this is where he will lose his fight with uh cancer but being the general being the man he is he finishes it you know so just explain a little bit why he decides to go to mount mcgregor sure sure and i have a picture of mount mcgregor behind me it's the same building that you, you have in the center of your photographs there um he has a near-death experience in march when he has to testify against ward and uh, fish and the lawyers come to his house and take a deposition and it's such a stressful uh, experience that uh, it nearly kills him 
he recovers in early April. And the doctors realize like summer's coming, we got to get him out of the city because he's not going to be able to survive another battle like that. So Joseph Drexel, an industrialist from Philadelphia, actually offers the use of a private cottage at the top of a mountain in uh, um, uh, just north of Saratoga Springs. And uh, there's a big new luxury hotel there known as the Balmoral. Uh, this house was built next to the Balmoral as a private cottage for the Drexel family. They have not even had the time to use it at all and the, um, when they offer it to Grant. So uh, Grant accepts that offer. And uh, uh, at the, the middle of, uh, at the beginning of June, he gets on a train and uh, a train that is donated by his good friend Vanderbilt, by the way. Uh, and that'll take him up to Saratoga Springs. From there, they'll take him up to the top of Mount Gregor and into the cottage. Uh, it's a difficult journey. It'll be a couple of days before he's able to come back out and uh, see the public after that. But he'll sit on the porch and to just spend the next few days writing. And his habit is to write in the mornings. Uh, he'll take a nap while his, um, his staff, you know, and again, it's Noble Dawson, Fred, um, they'll proofread things, fact check things, take some notes. One, uh, one or, or both of his daughters-in-law who are there will read back to him in the afternoons what he has written that morning, and that'll suggest some notes for him to work on for the next day. And this is kind of his pattern. He'll have a, a parade of visitors that will come to see him over his last few weeks that are there. Um, and there's some really neat accounts. Um, and, and what's I think most incredible from a historian's point of view is that by this point, his voice is so uh, deteriorated that he can't really speak. And so he writes out what he wants to say. And so we have all these slips of paper that constitute his half of every conversation he was engaged with during the last six weeks of his life. Um, Dawson called it his paper talk. Um, uh, those slips of paper are, are collected in the, uh, the papers of Ulysses S. Grant. You can find transcripts of them there. Um, they, you can see various samples on display at Grant Cottage. Um, so it's really neat that we've got this documentary evidence of what he was thinking and saying. Um, and that's how he'll spend his last six weeks trying to finish that book. And as you say, he's the general. He sees it through. That sense of resolve that pushed him through the war gets him through this project. Um, Julie is convinced that the book is killing him, but the rest of the family is convinced it's the book that's keeping him alive. Uh, and on July third, uh, uh, excuse me, um, on July twentieth, he finishes that book and um, takes a, a walk with his, or he, he's riding in a bath chair, but uh, everybody gets, takes a walk down to this beautiful overlook that lets him uh, look out over the Hudson Valley to the east. And it's just a gorgeous view. You can still see it today. Um, and uh, it was so exhausting to get down there, even though it was just a, a couple hundred yards that Grant has to turn around and get taken back up to the cottage and they get lost in the woods. And it's just a terrible toll on him. And he takes to bed and never gets up again. And uh, just a couple mornings later in the morning of July 23rd, at, uh, a few minutes after eight o'clock uh, in the morning, um, he will finally pass away. Um, he beat his deadline by three days. And I understand that you own a first edition of the memoirs. I do. And which sounds wicked cool, except they're fairly common because, um, you know, Twain had a bajillion of them printed up. He sold them by, uh, by subscription, which means that people would sign up and commit to buying a copy and pay a down payment. And then when they were, you know, when he had enough subscriptions sold that he knew he would pay for the book, that's when he finally printed it. It came in five different editions. Um, and he was right. People felt morally obligated to own a copy of this book. And so it's sold, you know, in the hundreds of thousands. Um, you know, Julia gets a check for $250,000 by the end of the year in royalties, um, gets uh, $400,000 in royalties by the end of the first year. Um, so it's, uh, it's certainly licensed to print money. As a result, though, he printed up a lot of copies. So uh, they're I wouldn't say it's super easy to find, but you know, they're certainly not the rarest of books. No, and obviously the reception of the memoirs, it, so it went down quite well. And the other thing is, is the loss in legacy, because I mean, it's, I think probably because of the documentary as well, but he's very popular again at the moment, Grant. And uh, so 
it's being read, it's being listened to again by uh, new people, including myself. You know, so what what was his uh, what was the reception like when it first came out? Um, almost universally effusive. Uh, you know, there are a couple of people that are just not going to like Grant no matter what. Um, but the literary establishment really embraced this book. Uh, William Dean Howells, Twain's friend, agreed that it was a masterpiece. Um, and, and, you know, it was just, it sold a lot of copies. It was commercially successful. It was critically successful. Um, Grant is lauded for his clean, crisp, um, concise prose. Uh, it's still accessible today. You can pick that book up and know exactly what he's talking about. It's a book that has never been out of print. Uh, you can get it for free online, but publishers still print new editions of it. Um, the University of Mississippi, uh, which manages the Ulysses S. Grant papers, they just published a new edition of the memoirs, fully annotated, of a fantastic book. Um, the the resources uh, from the annotations, and then Elizabeth Sampson, a, a historian uh, from West Point, published a copy of the memoirs with her own annotations the following year, uh, and, and those are fun annotations to read, by the way. Uh, and so, you know, it's a book that that continues to find new audiences, continues to find new ways to look at it. Uh, Ron Chernow's book certainly did a lot to bring new people to Grant, as you said, and so uh, it's really a, an accessible book, and I highly recommend it. Yeah, and um, so I, obviously, like you said, you've got a photograph over the back of you, so I understand that you uh, visited Grant's Cottage. Did this help him write in your book, and what other resources did you tap into in order to put the book together? Also, what was it like sitting and walking in the same place the great man himself did? And, uh, you know, Grant actually wore slippers as he was uh, sitting there working, but uh, I wore my cowboy boots so I could hear him clomp on the uh, wooden floors, which is a, a great sound. Um, for me, as a writer, to write a book about a guy who was writing a book, kind of geeky, but also fun. And I had the chance really to kind of put myself into the book a little bit and ask the sorts of questions that a writer might ask himself about the process, um, which helped me connect with the story in a very personal way. Um, so there's there's actually a little, you know, as I said, a bit of first person um, memoir to this book of my own um, as I sort of reflect on Grant's journey. Uh, the folks at Grant Cottage could not have been kinder and more helpful. I've had the privilege to be there a couple times, give a couple talks up there. Uh, their staff, particularly Ben Kemp, who is their operations manager, just a fantastic guy. Um, they opened their doors to me, um, let me, uh, you know, uh, into their photo archives. They let me just kind of be in the house, um, let me kind of do my thing, have my cheeky moment, as you've said. Um, Steve Trim, whose photo is there on the right, where I'm standing with him, um, he is an interpreter of a Grant Cottage. He not only does Grant, but he does Fred Grant, and he does uh, other characters who are part of the Grant story. He's got a, a theater background, uh, and he was just a wonderful resource um, to tell me about the history of the cottage itself. He's got a neat little book that talks about the history of the building um, that I highly recommend. Uh, so um, I just can't sing the praises of the folks at Grant Cottage enough. They're wonderful, wonderful folks. Awesome. Um, okay, um, just what I've got you, I would like to quickly just ask about the Civil War, because I understand it's a 10-year anniversary this year, and uh, so is there any special events you've got planned for that, apart from the, uh, the new series that's coming out? Sure, we've got, um, you know, right now we've, we're focusing on getting our symposium up and going, that'll be the first weekend in August, uh, always the first weekend in August, we couldn't have it last year because of the pandemic, and, you know, things were still even a little touchy here in Virginia, uh, this year, uh, right up until the very beginning of May, like we weren't sure whether we'd still be able to have the symposium or not. Uh, fortunately, restrictions here have have lifted, so full speed ahead. So once we get through that, then we'll sort of you know look at some other things we can do over the course of our tenth year to uh, further celebrate our tenth anniversary. But the big thing I'm, I'm most excited about is our tenth anniversary series, which is going to be a series of hardcovers that sort of collects the best of ECW over the last 10 years, uh, drawing a lot of blog posts, some symposium talks, some podcast transcripts, uh, a few original pieces. Uh, and uh, so that series of hardcovers will start coming out. Uh, ships from the printer June 24th. So I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. 
Awesome, yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, so when you were sitting there having that cigar with uh, Chris uh, White, did you ever think you, 10 years down the line you would have come this far? Not at all, you know, and, uh, you know, we we're sitting there and, and just like, hey, let's let's do a vlog, you know, and it has turned into so much more. And uh, as Chris's wife is fond of saying, you know, not too bad for some idiots sitting on a porch. You know? <laughs> um, but, you know, as you know, there's so many people that are hungry for these stories, you know, and, you know, you're, you're blessed with the support of a lot of great viewers and folks who follow you because they really value these stories and you know that's i think where all of our success comes from is that you know that same group of people who just um believe in staying in touch with history learning the lessons that it can teach and uh you know what it tells us about our own humanity yeah and again you know i mean what i like about emergency of a war is it's telling you all these you know things that you'd want to know you've always wanted to know you know especially the little battles some you know i know you do cover bigger battles as well but all the little things you know it's great so anyway i'd just like to thank not just you but all the people that make ecw so amazingly good um there's a lot of hard work that goes into it and of course they're all volunteers aren't they at the end of the day so they're doing it for the passion um which is great as well so all the links to chris's uh, you know to emergency of war Chris's book will be below um, and of course if you get the audio version you get the bonus of actually getting Chris to read you the book which is just amazing I mean your son is a very lucky boy you know I mean you you know you read a good book anyway well, that, my former <laughs> days as a radio guy is <laughs> yeah but that was really good that was a good touch but um yeah so I actually listened to the audio version I didn't actually read the book but I will get the book because I would like you to sign it when I come to Virginia in uh, August if I make it but Chris thank you very much for joining me it's been an absolute pleasure thank you very much my pleasure and privilege as well thanks for having me